And I realized the value in thinking ahead. I need to know what it is before I get going. I have to know why a reader is going to pick up this book. So I have to know who my reader is and you know why it's going to scratch a particular itch. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Melanie Harlow. Yes, y'all. It's so good. Yep. We had a great time talking with Melanie and she yep. has just great insight into get your pens get your pens yep. ready pull yep. over to the side of the road yeah <laughs> yeah 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 we talked about um just all kinds of like marketing and craft things um especially like thinking about how you're going to market your book before mm-hmm. you write it baking mm-hmm. in your marketing yeah yeah uh, newsletter content how yeah. you get people on your newsletter lots yeah. of staying creative. in your lane yeah yeah yeah, and we, then how we, to keep that creative so that you're not bored. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's a great interview. you got, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's really, I mean, I was taking notes. I, mm-hmm. I saw you taking notes mm-hmm. too. So yeah, yep. it was yep. great. Yep. So that's coming up. So uh, no new supporters this week, but thanks to all the supporters we do have. We appreciate we it. We really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And on that subject, um, I started a Slack channel this yes. week for the supporters that I haven't joined. It's okay. I didn't expect you to. I figured you'd handle Facebook and I'll handle Slack. That'll okay. be our division okay. of labor. <laughs> but um, if you are a supporter, you should have received an email so that you can join the Slack channel. And basically it's just a way for us to kind of chat together to mm-hmm. ask questions. I have uh, sections in there. If you have a guest suggestion, if you have questions, um, it will be where we'll post the zoom link if we do a supporter chat mm-hmm. and I don't know, I've, I've joined a couple of Patreon lately that have had, that have a chat and it's just, I was like, I think that's what we're missing with our supporters that yeah, there's yeah. nowhere the words because Facebook sometimes we can't communicate with them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and sometimes so I'm, I'm going to join y'all. I'm going to join. <laughs> okay. so, anyway. so if you don't have the link, just send us an email and let us know and we'll get you the link. But yeah. you should have, everybody who's a supporter should have received a link and you can join. And if you don't want to join us there, that's totally fine. But we just yeah. want to have it that option so that it's a little bit easier to communicate with us and with other authors who listen to the podcast. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so what's going on with you? Um, well, I'm still writing. I'm still doing my words first thing mm-hmm. where I'm mm-hmm. my words in in the morning and it's mm-hmm. going pretty well. And I feel like I hit that point in my manuscript where like, I know where it's going and know what's going to happen. And, right. and now it's just getting it all down and then going, mm-hmm. fixing it and making mm-hmm. it, polishing it up. Yeah. Um, I'm writing a book that's set on a Nile steamer mm-hmm. and I'm at the point where I'm just like interviewing different suspects. And the other day mm-hmm. I said to my husband, I was like, I think I need something else to happen because it's too boring. Just all these conversation, conversation, conversations. Right. I think somebody might need to fall off the steamer. Yeah. Yeah. Do something. You need a man know. overboard. Yeah. yeah. So, so they get eaten by a crocodile. Maybe. Yeah. I think <laughs> a so. different, different murder method. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I'm working on that and that's going well. And that's kind of been my focus except for um, pulling together some stuff for taxes, but that's about yeah. it as far as yeah. work goes. What about you? Um... I've been thinking this week because I kind of got to a point and I was like, mm, I don't know what goes next. So mm-hmm. uh, yesterday I, I figured out what I need to do. So today I started that. Um, and, you know, that's really about it. Just doing that. I got my hair colored. So there you go. Very exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> I did. I did want to say somebody uh, on in the Facebook group was uh, complimenting me on my TV recommendations, and I was like, "Oh, good. Yes, <laughs> I'm glad they like them because uh, that's uh, 
that's that is what I've done for two years, pretty much. It feels like just watch either stared at the wall or watch TV. So, yeah. yeah. But you were absorbing. I was absorbing and story and all yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. I, I can find excuses for watching yeah, TV and reading yeah. books. <laughs> me too. Me too. Yeah. But this episode is great and it's longer than uh, most of ours. So uh, we should probably get on with yeah. it so we don't take up too much of people's time. But you guys, I, I'm telling you, tell the kids to be quiet or give them a <laughs> snack and put them in front of the TV while you listen. It's great. Yes, it is. All right. So here is Melanie. Well, today we have Melanie Harlow. Hi, Melanie. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you? Uh, we're great. We are so excited you're here. It's yes. been very I, exciting knowing you were coming on. I am so excited. I've been like jumping out of my chair all morning long because I am a longtime listener, first time mm-hmm. caller. So this is <laughs> for me. Well, we are so glad to get to talk to you. So let yeah. me read your bio and we'll get right into the questions. USA Today and number one Amazon bestselling author Melanie Harlow writes sweet, sexy, feel-good romance. She likes her martinis dry, her heels high, and her history with the naughty bits left in. She's not <laughs> when she's not writing or reading. She's probably at Orange Theory or watching Shit's Creek again. She lifts her glass to readers from her home near Detroit, Michigan, where she lives with her husband, two daughters, and a pet rabbit. I don't think we've had a pet rabbit on here before. I don't either. Oh, Peaches, that's my pet rabbit. And she's so pretty, but she, this is a mean bunny, you guys. She's oh. so mean. <laughs> I didn't know. She does. Like, you think of like cats being like kind of. This is the most cat like bunny like you could imagine. Like, you know how some cats are sort of stingy with their affection? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like this, that's that's the rabbit I got. <laughs> oh my gosh. Does she does she roam free or does she No, that was my dream. Like this adorable <laughs> fluffy bunny hopping out <laughs> in my house. And we tried that and she just chewed up everything. Oh. And she bit one of our daughters. <laughs> so <laughs> she has like a fairly good sized area, but she is mm-hmm. like contained in one area. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's hilarious. Though. I know this rabbit, like they're supposed to live five to eight years. This rabbit's going on 10. Like she's going to live forever. <laughs> she has a great home. She's like, I love it here. <laughs> yeah. Not leaving. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. She's like, I got the easy life. I'm not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just funny. sent my uh, husband a, a TikTok about nighttime with your dog. And it was so accurate to our nighttime with our dog sometimes that, I mean, he doesn't laugh. I mean, he doesn't think I'm funny. I mean, he, he rarely laughs at my jokes or anything. And he called me and said, that was hilarious. It's so much like our life. And I said, I know it's just like it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> our dog is ridiculous. <laughs> Good for comedy, though. I know it yeah. is. It is. Well, let's start by saying, how did you get into writing? So I always, in my head, thought I'm going to write a book someday, even when I was little. But I thought I would write children's books, and that is actually how I started. I wrote a book, like a picture book. <laughs> I could not even tell you what it's about now. I don't. I don't even remember. Um, and then I thought, no, okay, I'm going to write like YA. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote three full YA novels and I tried to get an agent Mm -hmm. and, um, I think I did, they did improve, but like these novels shall never see the light (laughs) of day. (laughs) And then by the time I got to the third one, the third one was historical and I did get some good requests on that one. Mm -hmm. Um, but the agents told me um, it wouldn't sell. Mm. And I was so mad about it. I was like, well, what do you mean it won't sell? If you like it and you think it's good, like why would it sell? Um, so I had some friends at that time. This was roughly like early 2013 mm. who were starting to self-publish their, what was um, fairly new at the time, new adult romance. Mm-hmm. And they were having some good success. So I was like, you know what? I can do this. So I took my historical YA and I made it sexier and I upped the ages of the characters and I had a ball doing it. And I was mm-hmm. like, you know what? I, I think I really like writing these sort of like sexy romances. And mm-hmm. uh, I did publish it as a historical and I published a follow-up. Um, but turns out the agent was right. The market didn't really want it. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
Uh, they're still published. They don't sell like my contemporary stuff does, but um, but I still to this day that was if I could write anything, I'd probably be writing historical instead of contemporary. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you gotta give the market what it what it wants. Anymore. Well, yes, and we're gonna talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, we always like to ask everybody, what is your definition of success? Um. It's changed a lot, but I think for me now, it's the idea of being able to pay it forward, Mm -hmm. feeling like I have something um, valuable to offer, whether it's advice or insight, or even just like picking up the check. Like I can vividly recall being at an early like um, RT convention or something where I was like, the no one at the table. I was the little nobody. Somebody probably like brought me along just to be nice. And um, Kristen Proby, who is a very big name in romance and, and was back then too, picked up the check for everyone. It was just breakfast. But I just remember looking at her and and being like, wow, mm-hmm. that is so classy. And <laughs> and she was just so nice. And I admired her so much. So I thought that's the that's what I want to be. That's the kind Mm -hmm. of office I want to be. Mm -hmm. So once I got to that position, I would say that's now where I feel when I feel most successful, being able to to do something like that and pay it forward. Mm -hmm. You bought my dinner, so thanks. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) (laughs) it was that in Las Vegas. Oh, I think that was in Vegas. Yeah. Oh, that was a good time. And that was a good dinner too. Yeah. It was. Oh my gosh. Well, um, I love that answer. I love that. And you do pay it forward. Like you have your, you, you have your reader group, then you also have a group for authors and, um, yeah, tell us about that. I do have a group for authors. It, it started out, it has turned into something bigger than what I intended. Mm -hmm. I realized I was answering the same questions over and over again. A lot of my readers were reaching out to me and saying, you know, I really love your books. I would like to write something like this. Like, how did you get started? So I thought it would be really great if I had one central place where I could post the information about, you know, craft books I would recommend, Mm -hmm. or here are some tips for what to do once you've written the book, how to find an editor, all of that stuff. Um, And originally it was only supposed to be for people who were in my reader group and they, they Mm -hmm. would also join this, this author group, but people kept saying like, could I invite my friend in? This is valuable. And I never wanted to say no to anyone. (laughs) So as long as they were a nice person and truly serious about writing, um, that I I let them in. And -hmm. it was supposed to be for just newbies or aspiring authors. Mm -hmm. But now, um, like sometimes when I see and recognize a name that wants to get in there, um, now I, I'm kind of used to it now, but at first I was like, oh my, what am I going to do? This like mm-hmm. really super successful person is going to come <laughs> here and see this garbage advice I'm giving and be like, are you crazy? It's That's not garbage advice. It. It's very good advice. <laughs> well, but it, it's also been great to have more experienced authors in there too, because I have learned that there really is not one right way to do things. Correct. And yeah. Um, I am not wired like, you know, like you guys are wired. So what works for me, you know, in Bekasim language might mm-hmm. not work for you. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so it is nice to have other established authors in there to to um, pitch in and, and answer questions sometimes. And everyone in there has been very generous with, with their mm-hmm. advice and their time. Right. And it's a friendly group. I mean, I'm sure you you make a point of that, but but it is a friendly group. It's, it's, it's always people are very nice. I think so too. Like I'm really only in my, that, that author group and then my reader group and stuff. And I feel like I've been very lucky that it's been little to no drama at at all. But Mm -hmm. one of the things that I've spoken about in the author group repeatedly and and recently, in fact, is um, about being professional. And part of that to me anyway, means sort of keeping your head down Mm -hmm. and staying out of the day's gossip or scandal. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I I feel lucky to be surrounded in there by authors who, who agree. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I I mentioned yesterday in a, it's a private chat that I'm in. uh, Somebody asked something 
and then had a thing of popcorn next to it because some, <laughs> evidently something was going on. I said, we do love our from afar drama because, <laughs> and I'm making quotation marks because we don't want to be in it, but we do enjoy right. watching it sometimes. So. <laughs> right. Uh, Right. It gets entertaining, but, yes. um, and you know, I have typed comments and posts Me too. and been like, you know what, I'm just going to delete that and move Backspace. on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Two days ago, I almost jumped <laughs> both feet into something and I didn't thank goodness because it wasn't my business. I felt bad for somebody mm-hmm. and my empathy almost got the best of me, but I pulled it back because that's not my brand. That's not who, that mm-hmm. is not who I am. And I, there were other ways to support that person as, you know, yeah. besides yeah. online. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft when we, uh, I mean, when you started? So this is, I love craft so much. So this mm-hmm. is going to sound a little bit strange, but I, I wish I had known that the craft of writing, meaning like on a sentence level, mm-hmm. like, you know, clever turns of phrase or syntax or a perfect grasp of mechanics, um, doesn't matter as much as I <laughs> thought it did, um, or even as much as I want it to, uh, right. especially in romance. It's the craft of storytelling mm-hmm. that matters. Mm-hmm. Um and like, I, I love craft. Like I said, I love words and sentences and I, I love taking classes and reading books about it. And I'm always trying to improve, but I really think it will never matter as much as the characters mm-hmm. will and, and the story. I think readers will forgive mediocre writing, mm-hmm. but they will DNF a mediocre story or yeah. characters yeah. that they don't care about. Mm-hmm. So um, I think I agonized a lot about the actual words when I probably didn't need to worry about perfecting the craft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's the I reason agree. we'll just eat up something, even if we're, re- or if I'm reading a story and it's like the grammar isn't perfect or there's passive voice, but if the story is good and the characters are interesting, you know, we'll, we'll give the other stuff a pass. Yeah. to find out what happens. I mean, that's how compelling that is. And it took yes. me a while to learn that too. Yes. Yeah. It's a I remember, challenge. I mean, I've heard, we've heard more than one story of people reading a book or book series, different ones that people say, eh, the writing is just okay, but I cannot put it down. Yeah. And um, it's because they can't let go of those characters. The characters have got a hook in them and they want to see what happens. And, so. and if you listen to readers talk about, particularly about romance, um, or maybe any kind of genre fiction that, that isn't like literary fiction, yes. yeah. where the language is sort of the, the point, mm-hmm. you know, the beauty of it is, is part of the enjoyment is a, is a big part of it. Right. You know, they don't really talk about like the verbs. No. <laughs> <laughs> the sentence was so you know, beautiful. I can right, hardly stand it. Right? I love it. That yeah. metaphor. <laughs> You know, they're like, oh, that hero or, oh, the he, you know, Mm -hmm. spoiled her, this thing that he said to her, you know, that that's what they're talking about. They're not like, oh my God, I love the plot so much. Like it it is, it is the people, it is certain scenes that really stand out. It's, it's the storytelling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I ordered a sweatshirt. I haven't gotten it yet. And it's about to be here in Texas, too warm for a sweatshirt, but I'm gonna wear it anyway. It's one of the fourth wing sweatshirts. Me and wear it. Yeah, I'll come see. <laughs> uh, fourth wing sweatshirts, but on the back, the quote on the back is, it, "I'm gonna butcher this, but it's basically you could go. There's not a place in the world you could go violence that I wouldn't find you, or something like that." And even just saying it now, I've got chills. Like <laughs> for some reason, in that book at that time, that was a part that just got me. And yeah. when I read it on that sweatshirt, I was like, one, one click. One I, click. Don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't care where it's coming from. It's going to be mine at some point. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, this leads into our next question about marketing, because basically we've gone from craft to marketing talking about like sweatshirts that have mm-hmm. quotes yeah. from books. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you wish you'd known about marketing? The biggest thing that I wish I'd known about marketing is that I need to think about it before I write the book. And and I'd have 
if you would have said this to me, like before this career or before I, you know, while I was writing my first book, I would have argued with you. I would have said, <laughs> you know, what do you mean? I have to think about how I'm going to sell it before I write it. I don't know what it is yet, mm-hmm. but that's the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't know what it is, it, even after it's done, it's going to be harder to figure out how to sell it to someone. Mm-hmm. So I, about, I would say five years into my career, I started to study marketing. And one of the books I read was This is Marketing by Seth Godin. And he said, It doesn't make any sense to make a key and then run around looking for a lock to open. Oh my gosh. The only productive solution is to find a lock and then fashion a key. So that was really a light bulb moment for me. And I realized the value in thinking ahead. I need to know what it is before I get going. I have to know why a reader is going to pick up this book so I have to know who my reader is and, you know, why it's going to scratch a particular itch. Mm-hmm. Um, and David Gogren talks about this too, and he calls it baking the marketing into the book. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe he credits Seth Godin with the idea though. So it, it just makes marketing so much easier. Mm-hmm. And especially in romance, a lot of this has to do with the tropes. Mm-hmm. You know, eventually the goal is that your name sells the book. But before that, it is, okay, well, what kind of story is this? And, oh, it's enemies to lovers. Here's why people are going to pick it up. It's Mm -hmm. enemies to lovers. They're stranded somewhere. There's only one bed. And a reader can be like, ding, Mm -hmm. I love those kinds of stories. I'm going to give this one a try. Um, So I I think I wish I had known how important um, putting my own spin on those tried and true tropes was going to be before I was like, no, I must do something original. (laughs) The trap everyone falls into. I think we all do that. Yeah. must be unique. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the, like with the way you phrased it, like the, once they know your name and they've read your books, they're more likely to buy your books, but to get that foot in the door, having those familiar things and saying, this is what this book is about. That's how you can pull readers in that if you're not known at all, like if you're just starting out, that's what you should focus on and then transition hopefully into the, oh, it's so-and-so auto Mm -hmm. buy, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and I, and I think that it's easier than ever now to discover those little things that a particular section of romance readers, like all those little, I was about to ask you, how do you find out? Yeah. You know, scroll Instagram, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. all of those graphics that are made now, those with the arrows pointing Mm -hmm. out. And so now Mm -hmm. it it has drilled down. It has gotten so like, um, like the microtropes, like now we don't just say like enemies to lovers or friends to lovers or, you know, marriage of convenience. Now we have like, um, quotes, my wife, Mm -hmm. you just have to put my wife in the marketing. Mm -hmm. And that is an immediate signal to a romance reader, um, oh, this is kind of a possessive, protective kind of hero mm-hmm. going to, you know, burn the city down for his <laughs> his, mar- his wife of convenience or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, th- and there are tons like that. Mm-hmm. So you, you look at those graphics that are being made now to promote books um, in places like, like Instagram or even on, on TikTok, these this microtrope idea is is huge and it's helpful for authors who might be like, you know, okay, well, what are some things that readers are really going to dig into mm-hmm. in a story? Who mm-hmm. hurt you? That's another Who one. Who hurt you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, love it, love it, love it, love it. That's yes. so good yeah. though. Touch her and die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, really those true. are in my books. Yeah. <laughs> It's really true, though, that the tropes are getting more and more narrow like or more like you can drill down further and further because I saw one. I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast before, but one of our listeners, Brent, Belinda Cole, she had a Kickstarter and I went and looked at her page. And one of the things she had a graphic like about with the words around in the arrows. And one of the things was annoyances to lovers. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's OK. I'm interested in that because I don't know what the enemies but I like, I like it when they're just kind of annoyed and kind of, you know, 
Yeah, I love that. Kind of, you know, so like stuff like that, if you can find things that are even more specific would be, would be good. Yes, absolutely. I think I have used annoyances to lovers before in in my marketing, but you can have almost anything to lovers. But annoyances Mm -hmm. to lovers is great because you can picture that. You know mm-hmm. exactly what that is. And you could probably name five like rom-coms that right. have been set up. You know, they're not mm-hmm. exactly enemies, um, but they're not friends. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that, yeah. that's the smart one to to use. Yeah. Um, well, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that. And this is something that I've only recently been thinking about. The, the danger in that is that's letting a lot of other voices into your process, into your head. If you mm-hmm. are looking around going, okay, well, well, what's popular? What's trending? Mm-hmm. What do I need to work into my book to make it um, TikTokable, you know? <laughs> right. And um, I, I'm running into that myself now. And it, it's just, it's getting really loud in my head. So mm-hmm. I'm at a point where I, I want to be able to kind of shut the door and go back to where I'm just thinking about, okay, what is the intersection of what I really love and feel like writing and what my like loyal readers really want from me? Um, and maybe tune out a little bit of that outside those outside voices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's really, that's very interesting because I've seen that happen. You know, um, I've, I've seen that happen just in talking with people. They have successful careers. They're do they have loyal readers, but they can't get a foothold on TikTok. And it's, it's ruined their day. It's ruined their week. It's ruined their year, you know, and they, but they have success. They just don't have it. That's, you know, it's viral a viral success. Right. Of. Yes. The the viral success. And, and when we see it, we're like, Oh, what do you have to do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what do you have to sacrifice? <laughs> That's right. Where, what, what altar to have that kind of, you know, lightning strike. Right. And, you know, the reality is it's just luck. It's, it's just, just luck. Really nothing really you can do to arrange it. I wish there were. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, it's just like anything that's gone viral, like this, the thing that's big right now or has been big right now on TikTok is that whole series from that woman, Who TF Did I Marry? And it's 50 episodes of her talking about this man that she got with and then married that she he's he was a fake everything about him was fake and not true and lies and everything but I've heard those stories for years and they've done well on TikTok but they have not done what I mean they're saying that she probably has made three hundred thousand dollars just on those 50 TikToks in a week wow in a week I mean can you imagine and so, but I mean, and that's just from, that's just from people watching her. That's from TikTok. That's just, she doesn't have anything to sell, but um, it's just crazy because I have heard those same stories though on TikTok over and over again. And it's, it's just luck. It just something about yeah. her just clicked and then it took off. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, the, what do they call it? Like the zeitgeist where yes. it's something in the ether that mm-hmm. makes a certain subject pop off, whether it's like, um, so I see a lot of, of like cowboy era stuff now. And mm-hmm. I think it sort of stemmed from like the popularity of Yellowstone. Right. So if you happened to release a cowboy series or <laughs> you know, right at the height of the Yellowstone popularity, that's some great luck and timing. I mean, the book still has to be good. Right. right. You know, the book is still the thing, mm-hmm. but, um, but you will benefit from a little bit of that, you know, wh- whatever is culturally mm-hmm. like that happening in that moment. Right. And mm-hmm. That's why we you. call it a lightning strike because right. it's like the chances of everything lining up so perfectly are so tiny that chasing it is, you know, just not probably worth your time. Right. If it happens, and yet we still awesome. do it. <laughs> it's so hard not to, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's never going to happen unless you, you know, run out into the rain with your right. ball yeah. or whatever. So you got to keep going out there and doing what you do. 
Um, but yeah, it, it is nice when everything just aligns and what it you lines do up. Mm-hmm. suddenly has a moment. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Um, I made many assumptions. <laughs> I, I'll just share a few with you. Um, I assumed that good books would always succeed. Mm. I assumed that a compelling storyline had to be original. Mm-hmm. I assumed mm. that every release should do better than the last one. Uh, and finally, I assumed that if a reader likes you, that reader will stay with you no matter what you do. Yeah. Um, and I was wrong about all the things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, this starting with the first one, we know that good books don't always succeed. Mm-hmm. Um but I believe that you can give your books the best possible chance of success, obviously studying the craft, Mm -hmm. um, get a good editor, um, and then bake that marketing into the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do need to think about it beforehand. Um, You don't have to try to be original. Mm -hmm. It's not even possible. Um, I forget. I think it's in Save the Cat writes a novel where the author says um, originality is not a a realistic goal in fiction writing. Um, What's, what's possible is like a fresh spin Mm -hmm. on a tried and true narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, every release will not perform better than the last one. (laughs) (laughs) No, it won't. The truth hurts. Yeah. I don't know why I I thought this, like that it was just going to be this like, um, uphill kind of thing, but it's, of course, it's not, it's not true. And I remember this was like a few years into my writing career. I was really disappointed with a launch and I was talking to, um, Lauren Blakely, who's another romance writer mm-hmm. and, and a friend of mine and someone I really admire. I think she's such a good business person. And I was like, Oh, my, my release didn't do as well as the last one. And she said, well, who told you that every release would do better than the last? (laughs) And someone's like, you mean it won't? So you do have to get used to some, like get comfortable with Mm -hmm. some zigzags in your dashboard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not everything Mm -hmm. is going to, you know, skyrocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say in this career, you got to get comfortable with with being uncomfortable, just period, Mm -hmm. just across the board. And then you find your way through that way, you know, because for some, you know, for me, it's really uncomfortable to sit in a room by myself and write. That's super uncomfortable. But for Sarah, that's not uncomfortable. Standing on stage for me is not uncomfortable at all. Standing on stage for Sarah is horribly uncomfortable and so or even doing the podcast you know while we wanted to do it we each have our you know Mm -hmm. there are things about it that make us uncomfortable so yeah Yeah. the whole the whole career is uh yeah about being uncomfortable I think (laughs) and I've heard many you know author friends say god I thought I had it all figured out my last release was so great I was like Finally, I've got the formula. I've got the perfect cover style. I know yes. how to write blurbs. Like, I nailed it. And then, you know, the next release comes along and they're like, what changed? I don't understand. This should have mm-hmm. launched to the stars and it didn't. Mm-hmm. So it's, and it's frustrating. Yes. Yes, it, it is. really is. Because yeah. <laughs> we assume that, like, it's like... Uh, I know how to do a book. I know how to launch. Like you, if you've done it a couple of times, you start thinking and you feel like you've got a readership. So it should theoretically only increase, but we have all these different variables like within our books. Cause we never actually have exactly the same book. The timing's different. The market's different. So there's all these things that just often don't come together. And yeah, it's hard to let go the, of the thought that it should all work better yeah. each time. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I'm 30 some books in and I, every time now I'm just like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I do not. I go to start a book and I'm like, how do I do this again? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then it's time to publish. And I'm like, have I really done this 30 odd times? Because I feel like I have never done this before. <laughs> I, know. I think it's because there's so much time. Well, like for me, so much time between releases. that I'm like, what? 
do I do now? I mean, what's the, I have this list, thank God, or I would have already failed multiple times. So yeah. 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 Well, so that's quite a few lessons learned, but do you yes. have another, like a most important lesson you've learned or anything else you want to add to that? Um, I mean, I, I've talked a lot in the past about um, staying in your lane. Mm-hmm. Like I, I truly believe that, um, especially for someone like me, I only release three books a year and this year it's only going to be two. Um, so I don't write super fast. I don't write fast enough to be on top of trends. Um, so, I, and I think, especially now at this point, when I look at how much of my income is powered by backlist, that is just the biggest argument for me to just keep doing what I'm doing. Because if somebody reads my new release and likes it, I have 32 other books that they will mm-hmm. also enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. and do I get bored? Yes. Occasionally it, it does. <laughs> feel a bit tedious to go back and try to write another single dad romance. Mm -hmm. But I know that my readers really enjoy them. So Mm -hmm. that's the, that's the work of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, writing and probably any creative endeavor, there is a lot of, of joy in it, but it is also, it's a job. Mm -hmm. So you do have to um, sometimes just do the, the, (laughs) the work of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So when you're at a point where you've written 30 plus books, how do you, do you try and find some new angle, new spins for you to keep you yes. interested? Yes. And it takes me longer every time. <laughs> so, you know, because once you're, like I said, I probably have written maybe four single dad romances, but they always they sell so well for me. So I have to take my time and think of, okay, what, how can I write another single dad romance mm-hmm. um, that my readers will one click automatically because they know I'm going to deliver the feeling that they want. Mm-hmm. Um, but how can I make it a challenge for myself? How can I make it creatively interesting for me and for them too? You know, nobody wants to feel like they're reading the same book over and over again. Mm-hmm. They just want that feeling over and over again. Right. So I do think that, it, you know, for me, it, it does take a little bit. I need a little bit more think time. I'm also high intellection. I'm number three intellection. So um, it, it, I just, you know, I'm the bread machine that <laughs> Becca Syme talks about. <laughs> me too. I totally, I totally get that. <laughs> Well, what's the biggest change you've had to make in your thinking? I would say I had to learn that I am not my reader uh, because I, I, you know, you would assume that, okay, because I am writing these books, I could, I can uh, package them for myself, Mm -hmm. but it's not, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, I love women on covers. Like you show me a woman in like a vintage cocktail dress, Mm -hmm. like from the back (laughs) on a cover. And I will like throw money at you and be like, take my money. (laughs) Shut up and take my money. (laughs) Um, But that my readers don't want women on covers. You know, they, they want men on covers. Um, And, and so that's, that's just a lesson that I have learned that I, I know now because I've been at this for a long enough time, who my reader is and what she wants to feel. Mm -hmm. And I know how to package my books to indicate to her that this is going to deliver that feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that has the, the waters have been muddied a bit because of the uh, discreet cover era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We were so, going to talk about that later, but go ahead and talk about yeah, it. Yeah, let's talk about it now. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it just, uh, this is one of those things where I knew exactly how to package my books. I was on a roll. I was like, I've got that part figured out. <laughs> um, and then there was an entirely new generation of readers, you know, whether it was book talk or just post COVID, like everybody, more people were reading romance. Um, you know, whatever it was, the new generation of readers really did not want shirtless men on their um, Kindles or in their hands. 
uh, because it's also the rise of the paper baths. Like mm-hmm. I cannot, this is a thing that I never thought I would see. Like, <laughs> Nobody <laughs> predicted that, right? <laughs> yes. What bookstores are like popular again. <laughs> and, you know, paperback sales are, are crazy good. So, um, but it makes, it, it makes a difference in how you have to think about packaging Mm -hmm. your novel, especially when, okay, I'm 10 years into my career. I have built a readership that expects a certain thing on the cover of my book because it signals to them that they're going to get what they expect from me. Mm -hmm. It's keeping a promise. But in order to appeal to the new generation of readers, and they are hungry for romance, Mm -hmm. I have to have a cover that (laughs) <laughs> that they are willing to show yeah. on their TikTok mm-hmm. <laughs> accounts. So now, you know, there was this rise of the, okay, well, I'll have one cover on the ebook and then I'll just have this alternate special edition paperback. And so I did that for a little bit and it went pretty well. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go full on discrete cover. I'm going to do it with my ebooks because I'm a person who just likes I want it to be one thing. I don't want any confusion. I just want it to be one thing. And um, also, frankly, I was tired of looking for photos of shirtless men. Like it doesn't sound like it would be a hard job, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it is actually a hard job. So last year, it was book one of a brand new series. I launched it with a completely discreet cover. It wasn't illustrated. It was just like um, kind of font forward, really fun colors. I loved it. And I I loved it too. Mm -hmm. I just felt happy looking at it. Mm -hmm. So the launch went okay, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't as good as the previous books, as the previous series. Mm -hmm. And my previous series, it was a next generation series had done very well for me. So I was kind of expecting those (laughs) kinds of numbers. Right. I panicked and I immediately went back to shirtless men on covers, starting with the very next book. And then I recovered that book one with a shirtless. He, he might have a shirt on. Now I can't even remember. Mm-hmm. But it's a dude. It is a dude yeah. cover. Yeah. A um, smoldering dude. Yeah. A small, it's a smoldering <laughs> yeah. dude. <exactly>. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I, I, I finished out, there was four books in that series. The final one, the fourth one releases on Monday. And there are dudes on, on all of them. Now with a little bit of perspective, Mm -hmm. I don't know that the discrete cover was the reason why that book one, um, felt disappointing to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is possible that first I had gone six months without a release. Possibly I lost some momentum. Mm -hmm. It was a brand new world, a brand new series no connections to anything in my backlist. Right. And that was, I did that on purpose to have a true entry point because I had not Mm -hmm. had a true entry point in a few years. Mm -hmm. And so it could have been that my previous readers maybe were like, oh, I, I'm not going to know anybody. It's going to be a brand new thing. It doesn't look like any of her old books. So I think there could have been multiple factors contributing to what to me felt right. a little bit lackluster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess all that to say, um, I don't know what I'm doing in the future. <laughs> I, I really don't know. I, I finished out this series with with men on the covers. Mm-hmm. Um, and frankly, I'm scared about trying new things. New things are scary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I dislike change. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, it's tough. So your backlist, have you changed anything in your backlist or have you kept it the same? I have changed some things in my backlist. Mostly what I did was have a second cover, like an alternative cover designed for, um, I think almost every single one of my books. Now there is an alternate paperback available. I, I did change some ebook covers. I was sort of testing the waters Mm -hmm. and I changed some ebook covers and I did not see any noticeable difference in sales one way or the other. They didn't spike and they didn't tank. 
So I was like, okay, well, I'm really going to have the best of both worlds here. This was my thinking. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, I'm going to keep all of my original readers um, because they trust me by now. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to like gobble up lots of these new readers because they don't want dudes on covers. And I just, it didn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, it didn't, it didn't happen that way. Um, So I, I really could not tell you what the plan is going forward. Did did the second book, second, third, and fourth book, did those did those launches go like the previous series, or was it more in line with that first book? Um, that's an interesting question. So book two did perform like my income on a whole with book two was better, mm-hmm. but I think I had brought more people into this series. Also with book two. I tried a new ad strategy mm-hmm. that involved um, a really astronomical spend mm-hmm. that I, in the end, wasn't terribly happy with. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I did spend more. The profit margin was more narrow. Um, but if we're looking in terms of volume, I mm-hmm. guess I did bring in more readers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for book three, Um, Book three launched at the end of November, and I don't know if you guys recall, but early December of 2023, there was some sort of massive change Mm -hmm. in in the Amazon store. So it's hard because all things weren't equal. Mm -hmm. So it it is very hard. December is is always a good month, Mm -hmm. Um, but I I felt um, that it wasn't as good as, as December's of your, <laughs> yeah, of your. <laughs> your historical is showing through. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and, and for our listeners, lest you think that Melanie is just feeling all these things like me, uh, <laughs> Melanie is, she looks at the data and that's why I love her. She knows what she's talking about. Like, she's not just going, well, I felt like it was better. I mean, she has the numbers to prove it. Oh, no, yes. The the numbers, the numbers are there. I mean, and I can look at it in terms of like gross revenue. I look at it in terms of ad spend versus, um, you know, net revenue. Like what is, what is my profit like on, right. on, uh, on a release? So, um, yeah, I'm not making this up. No, <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear, I've never made anything else up either, but I do go a lot on my feelings. <laughs> oh. Well, so we have a lot of listeners who are newer. So we always like to ask if you were starting over today, what would you do differently or would you do anything differently? Um, it's really interesting when I, I really thought about this question because sometimes I feel like even if someone had sat me down and told me all of the things that I'm about to say, I, I don't know if I would have listened because I I do think I didn't know enough yet. I do think that there is some things you just have to learn by Mm -hmm. doing. But that said, I would have been more intentional in planning out a series. I I think when I first got started, my first contemporary romance series, I was like, okay, I'm just going to write a series about three friends, three girlfriends. And I set one of them in Paris and I set one of them in Detroit and I set one of them in And I was like, I I did not understand the tropes at at all. As it turned out, I I sort of was able to market the one set in Paris as like a a jilted bride book or a vacation fling book. Um, But I I didn't, it wasn't intentional. I sort of backed into it. Mm -hmm. I think if I were starting out now, I would write a series. I would do a lot of market research so that I understood how to package it and what are the kinds of things that readers are enjoying in that niche, whatever it is. Like, um, I, I found my sort of home in small town contemporary romance. I am a three pepper author. So, <laughs> Uh, like knowing all these things now, I'm much more intentional when I sit down to plan out a series. I plan the tropes for each book. I spent years, I, I'm going to say years, being ignorant about tropes and trying to 
avoid them and being stubborn about them. I wish I would have embraced them so much sooner Mm -hmm. um, because it is what will sell a book when you're starting out, when it's not your, when it's not your name. Yeah. Um, And then if I, I often think about like, okay, once you have some books out, like what is a, what's something that I wish I had known, maybe like 10 books in. Mm -hmm. And And I think that there is a lot of value in the the reader map or like the funnel in mm-hmm. knowing what your entry points are and then optimizing your back matter to lead them through the next thing like really like and you can do this like put your books on post it notes mm-hmm. even if you write standalones like what is the next logical book that a reader would would go to after they enjoyed this one. I wish I had understood more about the reader journey and been more intentional about that. And I'm still getting better at that. Like <laughs> just today I went through all of my bonus scenes. So I use bonus scenes as um subscriber like cookies to get them to opt in at the end of every book. Right after the end, I say, you know, thank you for reading. If you'd like more of this couple, subscribe to my newsletter. And the first thing you'll get is a bonus scene. You'll get a sneak peek into their future. Mm -hmm. And then I, instead of having them download and keep it on their Kindle, I have them go to my website. It's just easier for me because I can update things. And then at Mm -hmm. the bottom... I have, I lead them to the next book. Mm. That's really they, smart. Yeah. They also get a follow-up email for me the next day. Did you get your bonus scene just in case something went glitchy? And right. I say, if you didn't, here it is. And then I also say, and here's what's up next. Mm-hmm. So I am always looking for places where I can, you know, lead them to the next thing. I don't want them to skip any aisles in my store. <laughs> I want them to see all of the products that I have on the shelf, not all at once. I want to show them, point them in the direction that I want them to go. Right. Mm-hmm. You don't want them wi- running willy nilly through your store. <laughs> you just no, and you want to lead them there, <laughs> right? And the and the danger of sending them to the Amazon product page, of course, is that there are like a hundred other books mm-hmm. not written by Melanie Harlow on that product page. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really want to get them hooked and interested in, in my particular book before they get there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, go ahead, Sarah. I was just going to say, I love that because the stores are changing. Mm-hmm. And if you're doing your, them to your website, then you can hopefully pull them back there. If you have a store, you can pull them back there and you can familiarize them with it or you can help them become familiar with it. And it's just so smart. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting that you say that I have not gotten brave enough yet to link them to my store, like my uh, website. So I do send them to the Amazon product page. And partly that's because I'm in Kindle Unlimited. So mm-hmm. I don't have any other retailers, any other vendors for the eBooks. Um, but like, I I know that selling direct is, is and there's a reason that it's becoming more popular. I think it's mm-hmm. very smart. And I listen to the podcast. I've heard all the <laughs> you guys have had on here talking about direct sales <laughs> and and all of that and I'm really interested in trying something mm-hmm. maybe an audio book direct mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um if I really get brave I might try an ebook release for like 2 weeks on my website before putting it into Kindle Unlimited mm-hmm. um I just am nervous it's mm-hmm. hard with that though when you're in Kindle Unlimited because then you lose rank. I mean, it's you right. know, if you, and I know they say rank over bank, but long term, sometimes, especially when you launch like you do, that that launch, that great launch into the top 100 or whatever, pays off in the end. I mean, it's yeah. usually usually. I mean, yes, you, visibility yeah. that I will get from from a new release. I mean. I, I'm about to jinx myself, ladies. So <laughs> usually I I'll knock find, on wood for you. <laughs> usually, you know, the, my last uh, s- several series, I can launch into the top five, um, you know, top 10 for sure, top five usually. But mm-hmm. um, of course, I would sacrifice that most likely mm-hmm. if I if I sell if sold direct for the first two weeks on my website, mm-hmm. you know, um, so it it is, you know, my ego would take the hit because it is yes. nice to look and see like, oh, my book is in the top 10. Yes. 
But yes. also, um, I think about the optics of it. Yeah. If people are like, well, why isn't, why did she release this book and it, she can't even craft top 100 with it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, this is probably all in my head. Do readers? Yeah, really I don't think readers, readers, I don't think readers, readers are it's looking at that. It's other authors. <laughs> yeah, it's other authors. <laughs> I've it's been thinking friends. about this all day long. Well, <laughs> not just all day long, but today in particular, because I had to drive somewhere and I have been thinking about this, that, you know, the optics of what other authors think, and it's, it's what concerns me a lot of the time and it's a waste of time, but it's hard. Yeah. You're so right. You're so right. It is, it is, it's us. The call yeah. is coming from inside the house. In the house. house. Yeah, exactly. It, it is, it is other authors that we're yeah. thinking about. Yeah. 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 It is. It's hard. But could you like if like on your welcome sequence or whatever, could you say if you, you know, if you're an ebook reader, go here. But if you love a paperback, send them to your paperback store. Good. And you know, I I did open up a paperback store in small batches uh-huh. because I have literally one woman running it and she's yeah. like a one woman show. <laughs> and, and and she gets, you know, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Like, yeah. We, yeah. we drop you know, books onto it, they sell very quickly. And then she's got to do all the shipping and, and all uh, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Um, so we've done it and it's been manageable in kind of small batches at a time, but it, it, it has at least given me, um, you know, hope and the, the idea yeah. for, okay, yeah. maybe this is possible. People will come to my website to shop, you know, right. obviously not in the volume that the Kindle store is going to get. Correct. Mm-hmm. But I do think mm-hmm. there is something to serving your, you know, readers more mm-hmm. rather than um, being so concerned with, well, I need to get the widest um, possible audience. Do right. you know what I mean? Like yeah. going deeper yeah. instead of constantly trying to grab broader. I, mm-hmm. I, I often think back to um, what Seth Godin said about um, the smallest, I think he calls it the smallest viable audience. Like mm-hmm. it is impossible to build a brand that will appeal to everyone. Correct. So you really have to pick your readers and then serve those readers consistently mm-hmm. quality, you know, on a reliable schedule. Um, yeah. and those are your whales mm-hmm. and the whales pay for the minnows. Yeah. 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 Something you might think about, I've seen this with Kickstarters is that people say, buy one to read and one for your shelf. Mm-hmm. So maybe your ebook is the one you're going to read and the paperback is the one you're going to put on your shelf and display. You know, you don't want to crack the spine because you want it all to be pristine. So maybe somehow that can. Yeah, I was thinking about that because Arts. we do have KU readers and they, so they're getting it quote unquote for free. So to incentivize them doing both, you, they pay a little bit more, but they get both. Yeah. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah. yeah. One, one, two, I mean, book collecting is yes. a th- huge. Wow. Yes. All these pictures of these readers standing in front of their shelves, just full of books. And they're I mean, bowing. They're, yeah. I can, yeah, yes, with all these beautiful. And they have 11 different editions of the same book. You know what I mean? Like you, if yeah. you love an author, mm-hmm. if, if a reader loves an author, they are purchasing every yeah. possible special edition of that story that they right. love. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. It is. It's amazing. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of kind of knowing your audience and serving your audience, you do this talk at, and I've heard, I've heard it um, at Nink. I think is where I heard it um, about if you're, no, I heard it at Inkers. Um, if your, um uh, Audience, I mean, if your readers want cake, don't give them spaghetti. Oh, don't serve spaghetti when yes. they ordered cake. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I knew I would butcher it. But <laughs> <laughs> so tell us that. Tell us about that. Tell I, that's a one hour talk, but give it to us and you yeah. Know. I'll give you the thirty second version. Yeah. Essentially, it, it is that what I learned about becoming a one click author mm-hmm. that the, the fastest, easiest way. I mean, nothing is easy, but. Um, to do that is to stay in your lane, yes. you know, to, to pick that audience that you are going to serve. And for me, it's readers of three pepper, small town, contemporary, 
romance. Mm -hmm. So I'm very consistent with my heat level, with the kinds of tropes, the kinds of characters that I use, with the sorts of uh, covers that I have. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I don't veer off genre. Um, You know, you won't. I I did it one time, Mm -hmm. and I will never do it again. Um, Not that I didn't enjoy the experience. I really loved the experience. Um, But I saw what it did to my income Mm -hmm. and it took me a while to get back uh, the the readers that had left because I wasn't giving them what they wanted. And Mm -hmm. then I had to go back and get them again. Um, So that's really, you know, once you, and then once you are lucky enough and skilled enough to build a brand that is recognizable and readers have come to trust that you are going to keep that promise because that's what a brand is. It's the promise mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that you're going to deliver that feeling. Um, don't abuse that trust. <laughs> don't yeah. break that trust. You know, yeah. um, the market associates frequency with trust. Mm-hmm. So the more consistently you put out on a reliable schedule, whatever it is that your readers want, um, the more automatic that that click is. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Very true. I agree. And I mean, that's just so, I mean, I think that our listeners should really listen to that and that, I mean, you are a one click author and you, you've done very well and you, but it's been, again, with your data and everything. I mean, like when you do this talk, you show your data, but yeah. <laughs> like there's this dip and then there's this huge spike and the spike keeps I mean, it's just up. It's up the rest of the time. I mean, and and because before I did that marketing research that I talked about, it was right around 2018. So I had been in this for, you know, five years. I was probably 15 books in. Mm-hmm. And I just saw it was so up and down. I thought I'm doing something wrong. And I knew I wasn't getting worse as a writer. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I was like, I think it has something to do with the marketing of these books. And I realized it was because I wasn't thinking about it until the book was already done. Mm -hmm. So that was when I realized, okay, I really need to think about why is somebody going to pick up this book even before I write it? I need to know what they're looking for. I try every single time to write the blurb before I write the book. It's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, writing a blurb is hard (laughs) no matter what, but um, (laughs) That really helps me understand if I'm struggling to write the blurb, I think, okay, I don't know what this book is. Yeah. And that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Like me, I have a good idea. I don't have a story. Yeah. 100%. Or yes. I have, I have a situation. A situation ship. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Like, but it's not a story. No, so I, I got to yeah. go back and think about it some more until, and some people like discovery writers do need to just mm-hmm. get in there and, mm-hmm. and feel it out. And I, I'm probably more of a discovery writer than a plotter. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. terrible at plotting, but I do know what it is, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then I let it, you know, fill in as I'm typing yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I have to know where I'm going, even if it's yes. very vague and foggy. I still have to kind of know the path. I get yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, yeah. and I think and knowing what is going to make the reader pick it up, you mm-hmm. can know that and still not know exactly, you know, what happens mm-hmm. in every scene, mm-hmm. but you can know what's going to make this book sell. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I, I think I try every time. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, what is the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success? Um, I think probably staying in my lane, (laughs) you know, um, is one thing is the main thing, you know, really sticking, even when I, like I said, I get, I do get bored. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I power through, um, and I, I have not tried to rush myself. Um, I wish I was a faster writer, but I know that in order to, maintain the quality that I want to put into my books, I cannot release a book every other month. So, you know, three, four months is, is a r- realistic pace for me. And I, and I think that I have been, I think it's been a good decision for me to work with the way that I am wired. And I highly recommend Becca Symes strengths for Clifton mm-hmm. strengths for writers mm-hmm. class. If anybody is interested in learning more about the way that they are wired and what might be, um, 
good strategy for them in terms of writing and publishing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I also think taking my newsletter seriously. Mm. Nothing moves the needle for me like a newsletter. Right. Um, so, and, and I, I built a really nice, robust subscriber list and I am good to them. I'm, I'm in their inbox reliably every other Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, Mm -hmm. so they, they know what to expect from me and I, I try to serve them every single time. That's great. That's great. How do you mind us asking that? I mean, we're. Like yeah, I mean, newsletters? yeah, because I think that's a big question for a lot of newer authors and even established authors. In fact, I was in a room this morning in Clubhouse and people were like, we were all talk, and most of us in there have been doing this for a while. And we were talking about newsletters and what we put in and stuff. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I think getting them on there, I use those bonus scenes and I get this question a lot and, and, and I forget that it's not obvious sometimes when I say it, yes, I do write one for every single book. Mm-hmm. So I don't really have an evergreen opt-in that brings yeah. a lot of subscribers in the way that I'm, I'm getting them is, um, is those at the very end, right after the end, want more, click here. Mm -hmm. Uh, In a paperback, I use a QR code since they're not on a device. Right. So I have a QR code. They just scan it and they'll be able to opt into my newsletter that way. And then in the actual newsletter, it's structured the same way each time. I have something that I'm leading with and it's usually either if it's not a new release or something is new in audio, it's a freebie. So I will plan out my newsletter content, I would say per quarter. Sometimes if I'm really on the ball, it's like every six months, mm-hmm. but per quarter. And I'll go through and I'll mark off like the two two where I will have a new release to talk about, mm-hmm. um, where I'll have a cover reveal to talk about. So I, I'll, and I'll put a star by like, this is the lead. Mm-hmm. This is the thing I'm going to talk about. And then where the holes are. I look at my backlist and I think, okay, well, what would make sense to have, uh, what freebie would make sense here? Is there another book in the series that I'm releasing in that it would make sense to make free right now? Mm -hmm. If so, uh, can I get a book bub for it? I might try to apply. I'm usually rejected. I just got one for the first time in like three years. Wow. Yay. I know. Thank you. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And if I can't get a uh, book Bob, then I use written word media. I love written word media. I do too. Mm-hmm. Free Booksy and uh, Red Feather have worked well for me. And it's very easy to schedule them. I mean, you don't have to book it months in advance, usually just a couple of weeks. And it's predictable. It's mm-hmm. not like a book bub where you're like, am I going to get it? Yeah. Um, and it's affordable. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I just sort of make a calendar. So I have the thing that I'm leading with, I'll have a freebie or a sale. Um, then usually I have a recommendation or two, like, a, and, and those are like swaps with friends mm-hmm. who also write in my genre. Like you won't find me, uh, with a horror book or like a, yeah. you know, a domestic thriller. Cause it wouldn't make sense yeah. for my, yeah. for my readers. And then in the end, I always close with a very personal paragraph, what I'm doing, what I'm working on, what my family is up to, what vacation or trip that I took. And I usually include a personal photo. Mm -hmm. And inevitably when people reply to my newsletters, that's always the part that they want to talk about. (laughs) You know, yeah, yeah, the personal stuff. Yeah. 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 My oldest daughter recently moved to New York city and that was a really big deal for me. I was like, oh my gosh, I just, she's 18, but I felt like I left my baby in Times yeah. Square, like by herself. Yeah. And I had so many parents write back to me and say, oh, that's such a hard time, but you're going to get through it. <laughs> you know, you, you raised an independent daughter. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, that part brings me a lot of joy and it's a nice connection with yes. my readers. And I think um, it's part of that you know, if you know someone, if you like them, if you trust them, that's who you want to buy from. That's yeah. who you want to read. Yeah. That's a great way to end. Yeah. That was awesome. Thank <laughs> you so <laughs> much. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Tell everybody where they can find out more about you. Well, my website is www.melanieharlow.com. You can find me on Facebook. I have um, a reader group, which is Harlow's Harlots. 
Um, if you are an author and you want to join the author group, it is called um, Harlot Authors, but I keep it hidden. I'm a little bit precious about it. So, um, cause I just don't want, you know, any old people to be able to join it. <laughs> But if you message me on Facebook, I will send you an invitation link. And it really is a nice place um, and and I hope a helpful place. It is. Um, it so. is. For sure. For sure. For mm-hmm. sure. Well, thanks for being here. It was well, awesome. Yeah. yeah. My pleasure. We, Thank you so much. We have enjoyed it so much. Yeah. And yeah. we'll have all those links in the show notes. And those will be at wishidknownforwriters.com. And if you want to support the podcast, you can go to that same link slash support. So thanks to Adriel for doing the admin and to Alexa Larberg for doing the editing of the podcast. Yep. See everybody next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.